Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Laurent Kreplak. I'm the Associate Dean for Research in the Faculty of Science, and I'll be uh, moderating this workshop today. So um, first, I'd like to uh, welcome and introduce our uh, distinguished panel. Uh, so Dirk Arnold from uh, Computer Science, Kimberly Hall from um, Physics and Atmospheric Science, Anison Thompson from Chemistry, and Craig Lake from Engineering. So we will uh, start by uh, a very short presentation about the uh, uh, Discovery Grant and RTI um, uh, process, and then I will uh, let Alison give you a short presentation on uh, EDI, and then we'll open the floor to questions. Uh, so I guess I'll uh, get going. So first, so in uh, very uh, brief, I just want to overview um, both the discovery and the RTI evaluation process. So just for most people, I'm sure this is just uh, reminders. Um, so when you, uh, when NSERC receives your proposal, it's assigned to an evaluation group. Uh, in that group, there will be five members that are going to evaluate your proposal. Uh, two, so the first and second are internal reviewers, and then you have three readers. And uh, on top, uh, NSERC will request two or three referee reports um, out of five uh, requests. And then um, you have to realize that each member of that uh, evaluation group will read 20 to 30 applications uh, as, um, as internal reviewer and then 30 to 40 as a reader. And of course, the proposals are rated on excellence of researcher, merit of the proposal, and HQP training. And we will come back to those uh, during the Q&A. So uh, in terms of how your proposal is rated, Basically, it's the median of all uh, five members rating, and you have six choices from exceptional to insufficient, and you need minimum of strong in all three um, uh, categories uh, to get funded. So in terms of deliberation, it happens very quickly within uh, the committee, 15 minutes per application maximum, and you get a first internal reviewer uh, going through its rating on rational, then the second internal reviewer, and then each reader gives ratings, and then uh, it goes to uh, uh, the five members discussing and a secret electronic vote. Uh, if one of the categories is uh, deemed insufficient or moderate, then they have to give uh, some uh, uh, focus comments uh, as a feedback to you. And then, uh, things to uh, remember is that there is no memory effect in the discovery grant system. So uh, your previous grant amount is not discussed. The clarity and accessibility of your proposal is really key. Uh, and very often the summary for public release is used as a first opinion uh, by uh, reviewers and readers. Um, in terms of uh, judging your proposal, the committee is supposed to use only what's in front of them, and they're not supposed to be using any web search or uh, uh, check the validity of the information that you're providing. So th they have what you give them. Um, and in terms of referee reports, those are very important, but they vary in quality. And so um, they often in are uh, more important uh, um, uh, for readers and for the actual internal referees that have the time to actually read your proposal in full. Uh, and then I just want to point a few tips. I'm sure you're going to get a lot uh, through today, but just these are mine. So you're doing the right thing. You're starting early. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's uh, I think, the most important thing. Get started now. Uh, I recommend prioritizing grant writing over pushing one paper through the door. Uh, it's, uh, uh, at the end of the line, this is more important. Um, 
Very important to ask colleagues for feedback. If you can find one or two trusted colleagues that uh, are willing to do that for you, uh, make sure you ask them early. Uh, get a copy of the merit indicators. Those are used by uh, the referees and the readers and your internal uh, uh, reviewers to decide on the uh, ranking of your proposal. And far less important, but uh, can remove some stress, by uh, October when you actually uh, uh, want to submit your proposal, don't do your checklist, investigator checklist on paper, just goes to Romeo. This is now a um, researcher portal available uh, through MyDAL on the quick links and it will make your life far easier, not running around um, uh, getting people to sign uh, paper forms. And by December 1st, the university will refuse the paper form anyway. So you're better off getting uh, that done. Um, so that's for discovery ground. For RTI, uh, it's basically a uh, totally different process <laughs> with an um, ad hoc multidisciplinary committee. Uh, typically, the members review um, are, sorry, are renewed every year based on proposal pool. There are no referee reports. The actual committee members are the referees. Each member is going to read between 15 and 20 applications in full. The, merit, the, the rating is a little bit different. It's based, again, on excellence of researcher, merit of the proposal. And then you have need and urgency, suitability of equipment, and importance for HQP. And in terms of the process, it's based on, um, um, on a rating that each member does uh, offline. And um, the, uh, the member is uh, asked to do a flat distribution. So that means that uh, all distribution have to be run between uh, worst, one, and 10 best in a flat uh, way. So that uh, means that um, after that happens, all ratings from the other four members are compiled, and you basically get um, this is shared between the five members. And at that point, uh, they decide whether there is a discrepancy in the ratings. So if the ratings are similar across all five members, your uh, application is not discussed, and you get whatever um, uh, rank or rating that they gave you. If your application got flagged because of a large discrepancy, then there is a conference call, and all the flagged proposals are discussed. Um, so again, proposals that have not been flagged are just ignored in that process. Uh, and then after the call, each member can then readjust their uh, rating based on the discussion, and then the final ra ratings are sent to answer. So, so uh, it's a totally uh, different process and um, discovery. And in terms of uh, the evaluation, um, urgency and quality of research are key metrics. Uh, typically, amounts are not discussed. Um, Again, the, the members of the committee are uh, referees, so they are not expert in a given uh, area. Uh, typically, they are not expert in the proposal uh, research area that they are uh, actually referring. And so if the readability of your uh, proposal is key again. So that's all I have. And I'm going to let Alison uh, come up and give you a short introduction on Idea. Uh, I thought I not to you. Oh, you have? Yes. Oh, sorry. So I forgot to. Okay. My my mistake. Oh, right. yeah, I'll get that. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure I can have them in a second. Um, You have it? Yeah, okay. Thank you.
imágenes. Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Alison Thompson, I'm from Chemistry Here, um, and I'm the group chair of the K -K Chemistry Evaluation Group at EDSERC. So we heard from Laurent earlier where there are members of the committee who evaluate the committee, uh, who evaluate the applications. There's a, a, a chair that chairs that discussion, and then there's a group chair that looks after all of these different things, and I'm a group chair. And so um, I've evaluated applications and I've seen the evaluation process. So I think that's why I was um, asked to give this little talk today about EDI. So EDI, of course, is equity, diversity, and um, inclusion. And ENSOC and all of the tri-agencies are committed to um, increasing um, the diversity of the research enterprise within Canada. And you may remember that the federal budget in 2018 had an increase for um, science and, and, and engineering and uh, health research that was twinned with EDI. And so what that's materialized as is a tri-agency plan regarding EDI. And I refer you to these various resources to find out more. The point of this, of, of this discussion is we will be hearing more about EDI in the research um, world as time goes on. And so having an appreciation for it and incorporating um, into our discovery grant applications is probably wise. Um, we'll hear more about um, what NSERF has called the Dimensions Program. Um, you may have heard about Athena Swan, which is an EDI initiative in the UK. You may have heard about Sea Change, which is um, the uh, uh, equivalent parallel program in the US. And NSERC is responsible for this tri-agency um, delivery of EDI um, within Canada, and it's called Dimensions. And again, I encourage you to read more about it, because the more you know about it, I think the better prepared you are to um, discuss EDI as part of your discovery grant um, application. So, um, certain things are required in our discovery grant applications, and they start with the common CV. So, we're asked um, to fill in um, a box regarding, um, regarding sex and designated group on the common CV. And um, likewise, on the research portal, we're asked to fill in boxes um, as regards to these five categories. Each of them have a, I prefer not to answer box, if that's what you decide to choose, but it is a requirement to choose one of these options in order for your form to, um, to be validated. This information, though, is not shared with the reviewers. It's really for statistical purposes, and one of the things I get involved in at the end is, is evaluating how we did um, in terms of who gets funded, <coughs> is there gender balance, for example, and things like that. And that's what this data is used for. As regards our discovery grant um, process, EDI is included um, as one of the factors um, indicating excellence. So it's probably in our best interest to. to to make sure we understand um, what's intended. And so the goal then is to improve participation, long-term research and training success um, for um, underrepresented groups, such as women, indigenous peoples, peoples with disabilities, members of um, visible minority or racialized groups, and members of the LGBTQ2 plus communities. And I emphasize including, but there's others too. Um, these are the um, particular groups that are mentioned in the Dimensions program that I just talked about. So within that framework then, how do we incorporate discussion and, and um, uh, um, appreciation of this within our discovery grant applications? So Laurent talked about the merit indicators. This is a very squished picture of what reviewers call the grid. So around the table, when we're talking about applications, we are referring to the grid all the time. And so on the right-hand side here of the grid, we have insufficient, and on the left-hand side, we have exceptional. And so for each of the three characters, uh, each of the three um, components that discovery grants are classified into, excellence of the research at the top, merit of proposal across the middle, and training of um, highly qualified personnel at the bottom, 
one of these categories will be assigned to your application following that 15 minute discussion. And EDI is one of the factors that's contributing to these three categories. So, starting with excellence of the researcher then, how do we know what to include? The first things I really encourage you to do is to read the guidelines for the application. That seems really obvious, but truly, read, read them. And also, read the peer review manual. Because there's examples of the sorts of things we might talk about it, with respect to EDI and other components. Truly read them. So as regarding uh, EDI then, um, contributions to the promotion um, of equity, diversity, and inclusion in the research enterprise are a valued activity and are and and help help build the picture of our excellence as a researcher. Similarly, the importance of, of contributions by others, that includes a piece about inclusion and advancement of underrepresented groups and women. So if you've been involved in these types of activities, be sure to note them in this excellence of the researcher section. Somehow, find a way to describe your activities and your achievements in this regard. In terms of the merit of the proposal, there's a place for EDI there too, but it may depend on your, on your research expertise. As a chemist, I work with chemicals. There isn't any gender or underrepresented groups associated with that research. But for others, there may be some um, component that, that um, is related to sex or gender or diversity considerations. So if your research involves um, that, that type of thing, be sure to mention how you have decided um, what, what the subjects of your research will be. And you can't just say, oh, we're only going to do one thing. You have to describe why. What was, what was the thinking behind that? And there's no right or wrong answer. But it's the fact that you think to mention it because it's an important consideration within the research planning. So there's a piece there as well. And then in the training um, um, section, so there are two parts to this um, training piece. One is past training evidence, and one is a training plan. So there's two spots there for EDR. What have you done in the past that promotes the participation of a diverse group of HQP? And what will you do in the future to do likewise? How explain your process of, of identifying and recruiting and selecting research personnel. You might also want to describe how you um, promote that inclusion then. Do your trainees go on courses, for example? Do you particularly pull out um, behaviors which are inappropriate as regards to inclusion or exclusion? Do you pull those out? Do you talk about them within your group? Things like that um, can um, really show that you care about EDI and you care about in, um, enhancing the diversity of research across the campus. So there's three different sections then where EDI can all come into play. People sometimes ask me, what shall I write in my EDI section? And I'm not willing or qualified to answer that question. I, I put the question back as to, well, what would you write in the section about your publication? If you have a publication, you will talk about that publication in the best way that you see fit. If you have some, some activities that, uh, that um, fit with this EDI mandate, you should do the same. But if you have no activities, then you have nothing to write in this section. And that's okay too, but that maybe reflects um, where you are in that journey with respect to EDI. Thank there's one last thing that isn't about the uh, discovery grant process, but I try to share this information as much as possible. Um, with respect to NSERC leave policies, it's um, particularly with respect to um, either adoption or birth of a child. These two sections um, relate to grant holders, so people like you and I, but the bottom section is for HQP. And so NSERC has a, has a scheme that if somebody is paid from NSERC funds and um, they adopt or, or, um, or have 
the birth of a child in their family, they're entitled to six months of paid maternity parental leave. And that, that funding does not come from your grant. It comes from NSERC. It's an extra piece from NSERC. So share that information as widely, widely as possible. It's been true for a long time, but I think there's a misunderstanding as to where those funds come from. Yeah, so I guess uh, at this point I'm going to uh, open the floor to questions. So um, I think um, we can start maybe by uh, talking about uh, issues related to the common CV and then move into the different uh, aspects of the proposal. So is there any question about that part. Yeah, go ahead. Sure, I'll start. So, uh, if you don't mind, this is for the online viewers. So, like, uh, I'm just curious, I know there are, as an example, like um, DEI based chairs that are available, sort of like data uh, within the university. I'm just curious whether. The information you put on your C on your common CV is actually taken into account uh, in any way in the DG or the or the or the, or the RTI process. Okay. Yes, I think it, it totally is taken into account. The the application package is is reviewed for all three categories: excellence in research, and research, and proposal, and training of HPP. So this is common CV and the piece that is acquired through the research portal, the whole package is reviewed for each category. And so if, if you hold a chair with respect to EDI or you've won an award or you've maybe been involved in a radio show or anything, it would be on the CCV. Sorry, that actually meant uh, as a distinction between somebody who might fall under sort of the EDI category versus your contribution in that space. And so I guess it seems like, uh, I just want to clarify that for the DGNR RTI, what's only being taken into account is your actual actions taken within those activities, or also your own standing within those, those particular groups. So um, your own standing within those particular groups is, is, I would say, not taken into consideration okay. with respect to the review of the proposal. Um, however, you can make it be part of the evaluation by discussing the criteria on which a certain award or um, a certain activity were based, perhaps where you're coming from, why you implement such EBI activities, and if you want to, um, to, to align yourself with, with one of those groups, that's fine, you can totally do that. And there's space for that within the research portal piece, which is like a free typing section. Yeah. Thanks, Alison. So I guess um, just thinking in terms of the different ways someone might address CDI. Um, since you've served on a panel, I'm sure you've seen lots of good ideas. And it's not just about reporting what you've done, but also getting good ideas about how to address CDI considerations in, in the future. And so I'm wondering if there's sort of any collective wisdom that we can tap into based on what you've seen uh, in terms of things that people have done, ideas that people have come up with that would maybe be able to draw on, maybe not for the current proposals, um, but you know, for our next DG proposal in five years' time. And I think that's a good point, Rob, in that past, past activities are now pretty much done for this current round of DG applications. What you have in the bag at this point is what you've got to write the past on. Right? So Rob's point is about planning for the future. Um, to me, the biggest barrier to inclusion is Many of us are not very far along that on this journey of truly embracing EDI. 
And I say that because as group chair, I read all of the chemistry applications. There are almost 200 of them. And I read all of them. And the most common um, EDI, I'm talking about EDI um, phrase was, my group is open to everyone. That was the comment. As opposed to... And so, to me, that's not embracing. Well, that's how we've been for a long time, but the data tells us that, in fact, our feel has not been equally open to women and indigenous peoples and people of the LGBTQ plus communities. And so by not embracing that, that within our application, we're showing that we're not very far along on that journey. So that to me is the biggest thing that people can do is learn more about EDI, um, learn more about the data that tells us that in fact we have a problem within science and engineering. Um, and then I think people will evolve their own organic activities as a consequence of that. <laughs> So, 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 if you can give my prior student fits me in multiple categories of, of EDI. Um, uh, and, and she is a uh, single mother, um, uh, also from a non Christian religion. Um, yeah, um, so I, I did, did, did uh, just uh, elaborate on that in my, my past proposal. Um, and um, I, I didn't get um, sort of any credit for that whatsoever. Um, but I, I think also that, that um, so, yeah, uh, um, <clears throat> some, some things maybe not, not, not uh, uh, taken into consideration that sometimes um, uh, uh, inclusion uh, uh, is, is kind of um, at, at a bit of a tension between that and the expected productivity. Yeah, because we all think that, that the ideal HDP is, is, is very hard work. Yeah, however, uh, the, the, the inclusion also means women, but of course women have babies and, and uh, children are, are small children and can, can be uh, frequently sick. Yeah. Also, women include single mothers. Yeah. So, so um, if your HDP is a single mother and the child is, is, is frequently ill, that, that significantly reduce, uh, uh, limits the, the, the working hours. Yeah, I mean, should, should for these reasons, in the single models be not included? That of course would be absurd. But but it, it, it's there's tension between it and expected productivity. Yeah, um, I, I I'm not sure if, if 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 this has been really thought about uh, in, 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 in an answer. Because uh, have you a question for the panel? Have I a question? I mean, uh, I'm just make, make, making a comment. Uh, um, yeah, well, are you saying I should shut up? No, I'm, I'm asking if there's a specific question that we can help you answer. I, 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 guess I was just want to make a comment that, that yeah, and indeed uh, between uh, um, inclusion and, and expect productivity, yeah, there, there's, there's, there's not really a fitting together. So, um, at at the group chair level, we have talked about the fact that um, guidelines will be very clear about not identifying um, uh, HQP through um, any of the groups that we um, talked about because it's important to not point fingers at people. Um, and so um, collective data is perhaps encouraged, but not pointing fingers. If there's only one HQP person and you say, you know, all my current HQP are female, single mums, and um, and members of, of indigenous communities, then that's identifying and sharing information about that, about that individual that they have perhaps not given you permission to share. So I encourage people to, to be aware of that type of thing. Um, when it's about yourself, of course, you have a choice whether you write it on the form or not. But, but sharing other people's information needs to be done cautiously. 
Um, and then I, I come back actually to the answer that I gave to Roll, which is um, really thinking about um, the goal, the underlying purpose of um, the tri agency um, plan regarding EDI and bringing enhanced diversity into the, the research workplace. Maybe those things that you talked about are, are, are happening in your lab, but how did you deal with those? How did you interact with the individual? Um, those kinds of things, such as to ensure training and to ensure quality of the research. They would be the sorts of things that would be very positive. But I should say, we're talking about EDI because it's important, but there are a lot of other parts of, of a discovery grant application that um, need to be um, done with great care. EDI is one of them, but it's just one of them. Hi, um, I find this EDI uh, interesting. It strikes me as a kind of a chicken and egg situation in that, you know, I've never been gay, I've never been indigenous, I've never been all of these uh, other categories. Um, so in, in trying to, when you say my group is open to everyone, then you, you're looking for because of these this this action this action this action this thinking this thinking am I getting that correct no so in my opinion when the statement is very uh, clearly my group is open to everyone that the individual writing that does not appreciate the underlying factors that actually prevent people from being involved in research and these are very real barriers that when we learn more about EDI, we'll learn more about them. Um, as an example, I'm a person with a, with a speech impediment. The concept of walking up to somebody and saying, I want to be in, in your group, and therefore I will be accepted because I've asked that question, would have been completely inaccessible to me when I was a potential graduate student. So, there are all kinds of hidden disabilities and all, all kinds of hidden anxieties or hidden situations um, that actually don't fit into any of the categories. And by appreciating some of those within our writing, I think we can convince the evaluation group that we are trying to um, develop an inclusive environment. We can't possibly talk about every single thing, but we're trying to give the spirit of our past activities and our, and our plans that this is a sort of environment that Canadian research can be proud of. So that uh, brings me around to the question of people who either identify or don't identify. So for example, I've worked both with a person who is two-spirited and with a person who is disabled. In the case of the person who's two-spirited in the paper we are working on, she put that in the paper in her reflexivity in the paper. The person who's disabled that I worked with, I was he also you were mentioning your speech issues brought that to mind because he also has a speech issue which I was aware of, but I wasn't aware of, of the fact that he considered himself disabled. Why? So in that case he did tell me that, but as friends more than as colleagues, right? So we ran a situation where Obviously, I couldn't disclose anything that would identify him as the person I work with as a disabled person, so I would, I would uh, perhaps describe it collectively. But in the case of the two-spirited person, I could point to a published paper where she identifies herself as two-spirited and use that as evidence. Is there ways, should we be asking people if it's okay, if, you, if someone tells you they're disabled, should we be asking them well, I think I know the answer, but I think it's a question that you're using. So I think this, it's important to take a big step back again and think about EDI. We now talk about EDI as, as if it's a thing, and in fact it's an acronym that's got three separate words in it. Okay? And, and so the types of things you were referring to there are about the D, they're about diversity. So there's a female, there's, there's a, a person from um, 
an indigenous community, with somebody with a disability. That's diversity, and that's a measure, in my opinion. And then inclusion is about activities that um, make sure that recruiting reaches as many people as possible, and that in my case, for example, because I, I didn't call you up and say, can I join your group, that 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 would that would not exclude me from your group because of the way that your recruiting activities are, are put together. So that would be an example just based on my own situation. So I think we often think about D in EDI. And in fact, if we thought more about I and E, D will take care of itself, right? So inclusion and equity, how, what kinds of activities, and, and the fact that you're talking about this is already well on the way in terms of um, E and, and I. And then I think collectively what you would perhaps do is say, you know, in times when um, people discuss this with me as their supervisor, this is the action that I took, or I made sure that future activities did something to, to, to acknowledge that, or something along those lines. It doesn't have to be huge. This is not a huge section. It's a sprinkling of acknowledgement that EDI is, is important. So just to, to ask a further part, so there's an organization in the U.S. called the PhD Project, which helps uh, black and indigenous uh, persons become PhD students mm -hmm. and go through the PhD program. Mm -hmm. So would uh, advertising the, the you know, any positions for research assistants or for uh, fellowships or whatever in your as part of your recruitment program be an example of of uh, the activity that you're talking about. Okay. You have a question online as well. Um, this is about permission to share details on EDI. If you described an individual characteristic and how you help mitigate those issues that may have impaired their advancement or opportunities, you may be inadvertently IDing them. We need clarification on mechanisms of permission to identify individuals in the context of EDI issues. It's a common question. Yeah, so I, I, I think the answer lays in um, a collective um, response, a collective discussion, rather than this person, this activity. So to, to perhaps take it off the EDI train, I'm just sort of curious, um, is there an inherent conflict uh, in, in providing detail for the external reviewers uh, in these applications, or, or I guess and the DG in particular, uh, while still keeping it accessible sort of to the perhaps a less um, expert panel? Sorry, yeah, I guess I'm just wondering, um, so would you recommend writing a proposal for primarily a broader audience for the panel and risk a lack of detailed concerns from the external reviewers when it gets sent out? Uh, would you advise sort of going half and half or sort of like where do you, I guess, perhaps in a, in a broad sense, draw the line between providing explicit details that would be very technical versus broader approaches for broader strategies in your proposal. I can So I mean I really think a, a half and half kind of strategy is optimal um, because you need the big picture for the people that are not experts and the mistake people make is to miss that half. So but if there's no detail I agree that you cannot um, you're not going to impress the experts if there's no detail because it doesn't look like you've thought about the details. So I think half and half is the best approach in terms of text appreciation. Great, thank you. Can I just follow up on this is half and half rule? Does this apply to RTIs and discover grants, in your opinion? Or? Yes. So an interesting thing to find is that uh, you know there's sort of the traditional quantitative metrics like citation counts, agent, the and blah blah blah, which are 
you know, in some cases worth mentioning. But then there's a whole long list, and some organizations have identified other ways of measuring impact, right? Whether it's, you know, different ways of, of um, capturing industry collaborations, other ways of uptake in the community. But in those cases, I don't know if the panel would be as receptive to those in terms of rigorous alternative metrics. So I'm wondering if you have any advice on if you're trying to communicate an expanded set of metrics, how to do it, and is there anywhere you could reference to say, I'm not just making this up. Someone else actually believes that this is a thing, uh, even if the panel is not necessarily as conversant with that. Uh, I, I can answer that. I, I think uh, the, the case that you just um, discussed is actually preferred, quite honestly. Um, you know, any way that you can give concrete examples of how you make impact is, in my mind, preferred. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, like if I've written a paper that has been perhaps adopted by a regulatory authority um, to create a standard or, or a regulation, that to me is a definite uh, way of um, giving an example of impact. Um, and I think that uh, if it's still the case, I don't think the committee is allowed to search your, um, you know, your H index. Um, you know, even if you state it, are you? Are you allowed to discuss it? I don't think so. You're allowed to discuss it. You are allowed to discuss it. It's not supposed to take a major part of the discussion. Exactly. It's not supposed to take a major part of the discussion, but I think it's in at least the external referee's heads. Sure, but and I think that you know it's okay to discuss it, but you know giving those concrete examples of how you make impact, whether it be with you know industry or government or end user, um, be that you know. Could also be other researchers is, is definitely important. Just to follow up with that, it used to be the case that um, it used to be the case that you could um, include a, a letter uh, from, say, an industry to attest to the nature and significance of your research. Is that still uh, a thing? Like, have ex external letters to I'm attest to the nature and significance of your work? I've probably read 600 applications in my time at Ed and I've never seen a letter like that. Yeah. Uh, to, to add on though, rather than um, stating your H index, how about saying, hey, I'm an expert in this topic, there are six or seven papers um, in this topic, this is what they are, these papers have been cited 500 times, 40 of, of those of, of the citations are where people have taken my work and incorporated it into their own to achieve um, a further goal. So you do much more than state the number. Yeah, citation numbers for specific bodies of work are a measure of the impact of that body of work. H index, we are told over and over to ignore it. Because it's a career metric, it's not appropriate to use to evaluate progress over a five year period. So citations are kind of the same information, but it has to be linked to a particular contribution during the period. I guess like, still thinking in terms of uh, the uh, you know <clears throat> citations and expressing the impact of citation and the relevance, the context <clears throat> is still something that's relatively easy for people to appreciate. I think, but you know whether you get into industry collaborations where it's like I work with a company. How do you take that a step further and say, and here are some metrics that I can capture that show the importance of that? Or if your work, you know, whether it's some sort of social media presence that you can articulate. I'm just wondering, is there, you know, are there reference sets of metrics that you can point to rather than just kind of coming up with stuff on the spot? I think you can come up with whatever you want that shows the impact of a particular uh, piece of work, and I think you should not worry about the fact that the committee is not familiar with that particular metric. Just explain it if it's not standard. I, I They're open to everything that shows an impact of a particular piece of work during the period. But be as specific as possible, I think, is, is key to And And take a look at the merits indicators. Take a look at the grid. and and take a look at the, the level of detail and excellence that's required to get from insufficient to excellent. And ask yourself, is what I've written, is that enough for somebody to bump me up a, a bin? 
and then once you're at that position, then you go for the next meeting. Okay. I suppose this probably will also be like a half and half type answer, but I was wondering, uh, in terms of trying to balance uh, a a more risky type of project that may be a bit more out of your out of your comfort zone versus something that's you're fairly well established in, but it's like a relatively clear next couple of steps. Um, again, just wondering in terms of the discovery grant and RTI in particular, like, what, is it again? Is it just a basic half and half? Like, you want to have like you want to have some risk, but some sort of consistency, or would you lean towards having perhaps a bit more risk, where you can justify your connections? Uh, would that uh, would that add more, I guess, value uh, to that proposal? Okay. 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 I guess uh, one risk with uh, writing a proposal which is out of your area of expertise is that the committee might say, okay, so this person does not have the capability to do it. Okay? You've done, say, theory, and now you propose to do the, in the big system. But you're a theory person. You don't inspire trust that you can actually do the big system. So you have to consider that. Okay? Uh, but on the other hand, the other observation here is that this is, you're supposed to be proposing a research program, not research projects. Okay? So research projects are safer, but they're also not giving like a big picture. So it is a half and half answer, but, but keeping those two considerations in mind when you write your proposal. Okay? Great. Can I can I add in there? So the the discovery grant program is for a research program in the in the natural sciences and engineering. So that program piece cannot be over overemphasized here. It's often un, underestimated by applicants. A program in the natural sciences and engineering. So if if you have some research projects that are outside NSE, they can't form a major part of this NSE program. So that that's goal number one. Make sure it's a program and not just a couple of projects. A couple of projects doesn't get you a discovery grant. It needs to be a program. And then inside that program, there may be some linked projects, let's say, but they're linked within this umbrella of program. And I think the most successful ones I've seen have had some sense of continuation. So one of them is a continuation, kind of, of what's going on. One may be new, but not super outside your field, and one might be much more risky than that. And, and the key, one of the key words in, in the merit indicators is, is feasibility. And so what we heard earlier is a query against feasibility. It, is this person in the right place at the right time with the right expertise to do this work? But you have to balance that. At the same time, discovery grant is not for only continuation. It's for new research. So we have to balance that. Um, for someone funded by uh, both NSERC and CIHR for many years, can you comment on discussions around CIHR funding and NSERC program that occurs on a panel? Is that me again? <laughs> 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 um, so, there's multiple steps to this. In the um, NOI, which is what we're all looking at at the moment, and we should talk about that NOI and what the purpose of the NOI is, we should do that separately. If when your NOI arrives at NSERC, if the program officer and um, the group chair think that there may be some health research component within it, you may receive a letter. And that letter says, NSERC funds NSE please make sure that your application is about NSC and it's a program in NSC. So that's, that's one stage of it. When um, the application is discussed as an evaluation group, it, it basically happens within that 15 minute discussion and you need to be on the, on the right side of that NSC program. And so if all your excellence is in the health area, it, 
it's going to be tough, right? You really have to make that case, and the onus is always on the applicant to make that case. This is in the NSE, and it's a program. It, it's a challenge. So this is a question about HQP. So, um, so there is a whole spectrum of HQP, postdoctoral fellows, um, students, uh, master students, range, uh, and the PhD students, and so on. Some of them are supervised, some of them are co-supervised. So uh, how the answer values HQP in this sense? What, who are the most important HQPs? And, and if it's collaborative, let's say co-supervision, so if it's co-supervision with a person from another university, let's say, or it's versus co-supervision in your own department, how best to put this all in the application? Let's say the most important thing is to clearly explain what your contributions to the co-supervision were. Whether it's at one place or another is not as important, just because it is clear. And, uh, I think um, when you talk about your HQP, it, it's also it's not just about like what's most important, but it's it's also about what makes most sense for your proposal. Um, you know, you want all of your HQP and your uh, proposal to be very consistent. Um, so if it looks like your proposal is going to need a lot of postdocs and uh, sorry, a lot of PhD students, maybe less masters, you want to sort of emphasize that um, in your training plan. And can I just ask, sure. like, what about the existing ones? Like, say, if you had created several of them, and let's say there are postdocs and so on, so mm, in order to, let's say, emphasize most important, what, you know, what's the best way to put it? So, except for the for just stating your contribution to each HPP. Is that the CCV where you do it? Or, or uh, like when you talk about the contribution of what you help, if it's a co-supervised HPP, what you help to create this person? Is it CCV or the actual? I'll, I'll start. I, I think there's a couple of places. Um, definitely in your CCV is where you list. Um, but in your past contributions to HQP, um, that would be probably one of the places where you would explain, um, you know, what those contributions were and, and um, you know, how, how they would come. And I, I guess I'll just add that training at all levels is valued. Um, I, everybody should sort of try to, at least in the future, have a balanced group of trainees as much as possible. I think that's viewed favorably. But every every training counts. But but at the same time, it's not a metrics game. There isn't a magic formula. It, there's a lot in the discussion of what the training actually is and what the benefits and outcomes of that training has been. It's not just about you know I had two undergrads and three master students. What did they learn? What did you what did you help them learn? Um, whilst they're in your group, what kinds of things did you recommend, ensure they, they acquired, how are they using their skills now, any applications that they have. Yeah, I'd like to add to Alice's point that uh, in the old days, in, when there was a transition from the old system to the new system, it was a struggle the first couple of years how to figure out, okay, we have to rate on HQP, HQP is like one third of the overall rating, and there is no section in the proposal where you explain that, right? But that's past. Now there are additional pages that you can use to explain your HQP record and your HQP plan. So the space is there. Make good use of that space. Okay? And explain the details. Okay. So one thing that hasn't been discussed yet is the budgeting, right? And the budget does not constitute part of the grid, but at the same time there is a criterion about the realistic, you know, the realism behind the budget. And so let's say that someone is probably going to get funded in the forty to forty-five thousand range. Um, that individual obviously wants to propose a budget that's higher than that, but 
you can propose a budget that's sixty thousand dollars and well justified, or you can propose a budget that's a hundred thousand dollars and well justified. Like if you gave me a hundred thousand dollars, you know, the number of HQP, the funding of the HQP, the travel makes perfect sense. So on the assumption that you're proposing something good, does it matter if the budget is a little bit higher than you might realistically expect, or a lot higher than you might realistically expect? Because if you're asking for $100,000 and it's all justified, but you're not going to get anywhere near that, then the research program you're proposing cannot happen. So the, the discovery grants are grants in aid? So it's quite different. Discovery Grants is quite different to other granting organizations which run grants for projects. It's not for projects, it's for a program. And so it's granting aid for that program. So remember that ESA can't give you more than you asked for. And remember then that the merit of the proposal, the piece about the budget is about feasibility. That's, that's the line. And likewise within HQP. So, as Craig said, if you're proposing three master's students and your budget is about two postdocs, that's not going to look like it's feasible. It doesn't work somehow. That's not going to be seen advantageously. Um, I think it's usual to pitch higher than you may expect, but remember that there's no sort of pre-assumption on how much you may come out with. It depends which bin you land in. And then it depends on how much is assigned to each bin. So write a program, write your budget to match the program, and focus on that rather than, you know, in, in other applications, like say you might do for a project and I need one of these, one of those, one of those, and how much it costs. That's not this, this program. And I can say with certainty that uh, I asked for a little bit more than I thought I would get. And I got it, I should have asked for a little bit more than a little bit more <laughs> last time I applied. So. But I'm just saying that for the majority of us, $100,000 <clears> is completely unrealistic. So if we propose a program that has a budget of $100,000, if it's well justified in terms of the number of trainees, will that still hurt us because it's unrealistic? Well, I would go back to the feasibility. Uh, if your record so far has been working with grants of like twenty to 30000 and the scale of your program is, is that, if you all of a sudden come up with a $100,000 budget and a very grandiose program consistent with that budget, then it will question your ability to manage so much money in such a large group. So keep that in mind. The other thing I wanted to say is that in my three years as group chair, there was exactly one case when somebody got uh, a smaller grant than they asked for a smaller grant than their need. Okay, so pretty much everybody aims for higher. Okay? But I would also think that it is it should not be a huge penalty. I guess if you have a, a higher budget, they won't count that against you. Okay, but if you become extreme and you are inconsistent with your past record, then you, your feasibility may be questioned. So. And my experience has been that like the committees, they do look at the budget, but it is not like the break, <coughs> right? I mean, if you provide no budget as an extreme, then you will be made. If you provide a budget with no justification, you will be made. Okay? So make a budget that is consistent with your proposal, maybe a bit higher than what you expect, and leave it at that. I think sizing the proposal is the key part. So, I mean, I haven't seen the budget discussed in any case. Probably uh, brought maybe two uh, times. And yeah, exactly. It may differ a little from evaluation to evaluation. Computer science, the thought is we all have the same needs. There's and, no need to talk about it. And if it's discussed, it's because of some kind of flag associated with the budget. Some, some big problem with the budget. Um, so I won't spend a huge amount of time nitpicking on, you know, shall I put 20,000 for a PhD student or 19? Red flags. Such as? Such as your proposal talks about uh, graduate students A and B will be doing this work and your proposal is all about the Thank you. Thank you. I have another online question. 
I received my NSEC as a new investigator. I'm going for my first renewal in 2019. To all the published research papers by me in the last six years have to be directly connected to my discovery grant. You would have heard that. So my, so, um, my question, I guess, relates primarily to HQP and EDI section, since those are overarching things that everybody has to deal with. Is there any advantage to citing, for example, the university strategic plan and the fact that the university is trying to promote a very inclusive culture? Is there any benefit to putting that type of thing in the uh, appropriate sections? And also, if the university were to offer courses, training, that type of thing on EDI to the faculty, um, would that be would would running that type of thing in the um, the grant be a benefit? Um. So yes, but it's not about so NSA discovery grants don't fund universities; they fund in individuals. So it's great that the university may or may not offer these things, but what have you done? I mean, attended. <laughs> so it's great that the university offers, uh, offers them. Have you attended? What did you learn? How are you putting that into play? Can we, can we talk about the NOIs? Sure, sure. So we're all approaching that. The purpose of the NOI is to um, have the um, have the evaluation group members determine which applications they feel um, qualified to adjudicate. That's that's the underlying purpose for the process. So the way it comes to the evaluation group members is there's an Excel spreadsheet. It's a very long, wide Excel sheet, and it has name, school. Um, evaluation group that the applicant has chosen that, that they, they think is applicable and the key factors and the title of the proposal. That's in the Excel spreadsheet. There's, there'll be 200 of those, uh, uh, there'll be 200 lines in, in the chemistry one. Okay? The abstract, or whatever it's called, the summary that goes with the NOI and the short CCV are in separate documents online with a separate download process that I wished were easier to navigate. And so, what people are doing is they're looking at these Excel spreadsheets with name, school, topics, and title, and in many cases, I betcha, that's what people choose their comfort levels on. So, hi, I feel very able to, to adjudicate this application. Moderate, yes, yeah, some areas I'm, I'm feeling good about, some others maybe not. Low, I could probably do it at a pinch, or absolutely not, or I'm in conflict. And so that's the purpose of what you're writing at the moment. So think about that, and think about who is going to be looking at it. Um, there'll be some experts and there'll be some non-experts. You need both of those in your file. The other purpose is that when um, R1 has been assigned to so the person who's going to talk the most about your application. From that comfort level exercise, they will then select a list of people to do your external review. Your external review then um, is based on what you put in your NOI, topic wise. The um, when invited, as you know, you get access to the title and to the um, abstract to then say, yeah, I, I feel like I, I can do that. So that's the purpose, and then to get this flag whether there's a, a, um, a concern that there's overlap with either SHRC or CIHR. So it's pretty important to get the right people around the table, and that's done through this process. I know I don't sound very arrogant, but I know that in my field there is no expert in the panel. It's what I'm supposed to do. I know that there are experts elsewhere, but not on the panel. I mean, that's true for almost everybody, right? There's only so many people on the panel. You're not going to have 
it's very unlikely for somebody to actually have a true expert in their area on the panel. It would happen for a tiny, tiny fraction of cases. They're going to pick the person that's the closest. It's just the, the way it is. But is it uh, the whole evaluation and bias? Because that person who might get my application just doesn't get it. Uh, doesn't support it very well in front of the rest of the I mean, the, you have to make it clear so that they can get it. Right, so that you have to write your application so that even if somebody's not an expert, there's, they're going to at least get it. Right? The, the external reviewer reports are more weighty. They're taken into consideration to a greater extent if the person doesn't feel like they're an expert. I, I would say your backup is the external reviewers because you've suggested some of these people. The first reviewer also suggests some people, and they should have a more uh, will be more directly connected to your field. Okay. And the the R one, the expert that, that you were hoping for, yeah. uh, doesn't really support or not support an application. That's not how Discovery Grant works. Um, they evaluate the documentation according to the criteria, which is very different from some other competitions where there's a yeah, I, I, I feel very strongly about this application. I think it should be funded, and these are the reasons why. It's very different. And that's why addressing the non-experts really key, because there's four other people around the table who, who probably aren't experts anyway. And you definitely need to get to them, because they have 80% of the vote. Yeah, I was just going to say, there's nothing special about R1, except that they get more time to summarize the file more completely. But they only get one vote out of five. And it's even, right? So R5 has the same vote ratio as R1. So it's really just they are identified as the person that would be would have the easiest time summarizing your whole application. But if they don't do their job properly, then they're penalized because of that. Same goes for R5 and R5. Right? Yeah, I have very different internal information regarding my panel. I mean, I, I would say that, you know, there are a lot of times when, you know, if, if someone with an R1 was presenting a case that has an R5, I would disagree. And, and, you know, in that one or two minutes I had, I would say, you know, I disagree about these points. And it's amazing how, like, e even though somebody states a case uh, when they have time to talk, how opinions do change. Like, the whole idea is to listen to all of the readers of the application and opinions do sometimes change in, the, in that process. I think it's important to get into the psychology of the reviewers. And, and uh, one point here that relates to uh, panel members that are not experts in your area is make your proposal fun to read. The, the, the panel members, they spend time on their holidays over Christmas reading like a pile of applications, okay? So the last thing that they want to see is an application that is aimed for the expert and they cannot understand anything because it's all too esoteric, right? Uh, that's one. And the other one is if they have to look up other sources to figure out what you're trying to do, they're not going to do that. They're going to give a lower rating. So that's part one. Part two, now how does the process work uh, during the competition? Well, everybody comes in with some notes on every application, okay? Because you don't have time to look up the actual text during these 15 minutes. You have to have your points written down. You have your points, and then you have a, a I guess, a, a temporary rating on each one of the criteria. And then, as the discussion happens, if you are the first one, you're going to provide your comments and your ratings, and everybody else listens. If you are the last one, you will be on the fly adjusting your ratings based on what you hear, okay? And then in the end, you are going to have a final rating based on everybody's points that you then uh, submit as your vote, okay? So keep that in mind, I guess, and, and my sense is that having been on this committee for two, three years as group chair and three years as, as a panel member, my sense overall is that it is as fair as it can be. I didn't get the sense that people got screwed by a bad reviewer or anything. It's the five members, they somehow are able to balance and even things out. 
that's my sense from my experience. And I think the process differs a little bit between evaluation groups. Uh, some groups where the first reviewer presents uh, their ratings and their argument, then the second, then the third. Mm -hmm. There are some where first all reviewers and readers present their ratings and then can be arguments. In the end, though, you vote your votes. Your actual ratings are anonymous. So there's a computer in front of you, and you might not agree with the first reviewer, and you were not convinced by their arguments. If by the end of everybody's discussion, you hold firm on your original assessment, that's what you vote. And it's not an average. So if somebody's an outlier, and they just tank it, and it's not justified, they don't count at all because they take the median, not the average. So nobody can break down the average by being an outlier. I just have a basic question. So when NOI submitted, the CCB is also attached, right? But then between the NOI time and the, and the actual application, can CCB be changed or adjusted? Yes. yes. Maybe we should uh, so we'll talk about the NOI a little bit. We have not talked a lot about uh, talk about the merit of the proposal to some extent. Um, maybe we should ask again about specifically about the HQP training and um, especially HQP plan. Since we've talked a lot about the past, how do you actually build a strong HQP plan? That would be. My question is the plan. So the HQP plan is uh, critical for early career centers who do not have a very strong uh, record. And that's to be expected. Uh, so what do you include in your plan? I mean, you include, uh, in, in my case, I would try to include two parts. Part one is what is my uh, philosophy about managing my research group? Okay, what are the special things that I do to create a good environment for people to be productive and happy in my research group. So that's part one. And part two is to connect specific uh, research, I guess, threads in my proposal with specific HQP that I already have or plan to recruit in the near future. Okay, early career. How about the people who are writing their last pencil application? I might be right in my last one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, so what's the question there, though? Well, how does the HPP training then um, function? I mean, or is it ability? You're still going to have a plan. Yeah. Because you have a plan for the next five years. If you're applying for a grant for the next five years, it never matters what happens after that. Okay, so they don't look at, Because as you was talking also about the program, because program should be that something that looks also even beyond these five years. I mean, not necessarily. I think five-year program. Mm -hmm. yeah. And even then, nobody is forcing you to indicate that they're going to retire. The assumption is they're going to keep it on. Yeah. I have an online question here. Any advice on choosing a committee for proposals, researchers with a multidisciplinary research program and track record? Sorry, what was the end? Um, any advice on choosing a committee for proposals, researchers with a multidisciplinary multidisciplinary research program and track record? Uh, there are two parts to this question. One part is, it, does it cross grant and councils? And like, are you in between CIHR and ENSEC? So I think Alice put it very nicely before. What you have to do, you have to clearly position your proposal in one of these, in one grant, like uh, ENSEC. Uh, the second question is if your proposal falls in between two different evaluation groups. So NSEC is trying to do its best to fairly assess those proposals by inviting evaluation group members from the neighboring evaluation group and have them all together. The problem you run into there is that the different evaluation groups may have different philosophies and then you see a collision of those philosophies in the discussion sometimes. 
So my advice would be try to position your proposal as close to one evaluation group as you can, so that you avoid having like a mix of of, of people. Okay. So how do indigenous people with a holistic research program avoid that problem? The, and so which problem are you referring to, Jonathan? A conflict between like sure and sir CIHR perhaps, or even on a smaller scale. So um, the, there is a graphic, I'm not sure if, if others can think of the graphic, but there is a graphic. Um, this is funding from, from NSERC and it's for NSE. There are other programs that fund other areas and there are interdisciplinary tri-agency programs that fund inter-agency inter or intra-agency um, work. So we do have to recognize this is an NSE organization. But, um, the image I'm thinking of is an image that's got five balls in it, and four of the balls say NSE, and one of the balls says health or social social sciences. Um, so it's okay to sprinkle um, that other component within, and I think perhaps within an EDI context, there's great strength to that. But this is ESO, and it's NSE, so that, that, that does have to be the focus. So just to uh, add to this, uh, I would focus the proposal on NSC and <coughs> bring answer type problems as perhaps motivations or contexts that could be addressed using the technology or the science that you generate with your research. Okay. Okay? It's like application areas as opposed to aiming to make a contribution to social sciences. So, one thing about the NOI is proposing external reviewers. And so, one piece of advice I give to people is to try and optimize the referees you propose. So, satisfying the arm's length criteria, of course, but people who are likely to be sympathetic to the proposal, right? But my question is um, how important is it to optimize the referee choices at that point? Uh, and how else can you ensure that the external referees you get? are uh, likely to be favorably disposed towards your proposal? Uh, I, I would say you always should do exactly what you said. You don't have complete control over the list of referees because when the reviewer one picks the, re the people to suggest to get letters from, they are explicitly told to pick two or three, I think, from the list uh, that you give of five. <coughs> so actually one thing is that if you pick all the five people in the world that are the best people to actually, you think, will be the most sympathetic, yet at arm's length, blah, 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 the best people, you're automatically ruling out two of those people. Um, the other advice is that the R1 is also told to come up with international people. Like, I don't remember what the fraction is right now, but I think it's two. At least two have to be outside of Canada. It's really hard if the R1 is not in your area to pick international people because one of the ways that we're given um, information to pick people is a list of all the people that in the past have been reviewers. And um, as a person being on these committees, I also go back to the list of all of us. I've seen such a huge fraction of the whole country in my area. I go back to past lists of people that I know that I've picked up that are in certain areas. But those are all inside Canada. It's very difficult to pick the international reviewers. So those are the most important ones, actually, to, be, to pick carefully. They're likely to be picked. I mean, they won't necessarily be picked, but um, yeah, there's some comments. So I apologize for asking this, but that is a good strategy in your list of five to include three really good, really relevant ones, and then two irrelevant ones. <laughs> <laughs> No, because you can't guarantee that they're going to. You have to pick good people. Um, yeah. How, how important are the keywords you provide uh, in the proposal? Because I think keywords kind of be analyzed well. Yeah, keywords in the title are the most important thing. 
Okay. It's more important than the Texas or the NOI, and it's more important than the content of your CCB, because a large fraction of it's just like at the key, keywords and the title when we're deciding if we're comfortable or not with the application. And, and it's the evaluation group members that get the vote, not the external reviews. Of course, but you still want to get you know, yeah. good external reviews. You do, but good is a, it is a moving target as to what good is. Remember that evaluation group members have, have gone through extensive training and calibration exercises with external reviewers, of, of, of which I'm sure you all are, receive very little training. And so evaluation group members have to weigh that, that in when considering the external. It's more likely that advice and, and input on the technicalities of the proposal are going to be much more valid than any of the other sections, but still it's non-calibrated and so people know about the remedy. So if you get a ridiculously negative review, it never counts. I mean, if everybody disagrees with the external review reports, they don't do anything. They have no impact whatsoever. I think the most impactful reviews from external reviews are from people who have come from the system themselves, who are struggling to have regrets. They know what is being asked for and they address those points. Other reviews often are just discarded because people aren't familiar with, with the system. <coughs> Don't address the issues that matter. Yeah, just a, a minor point as well when you're selecting reviewers. Uh, take a look at the list of who's on the actual committee because they will not be able to review your proposal. Uh, this is probably a long shot, but uh, if if hypothetically there was one, one particular external reviewer, not sure who who wrote a review, would would contain not necessarily a particularly strong uh, a particularly strong negative opinion, however, things like there's a fact. Is there a way to um, un un honestly request that they be excluded from future reviews, even if they're one of the people who you might have? We might have asked to review it on your form. Is there a had to respond? That's right. Is there a way to say can you exclude reviewer one from let's say a pass at ten or from a pass whatever? If you have really strong feelings, I think you should talk to the program officer here at here at Dal and ask them to navigate on your behalf. River. Oh, we are almost running out of time. <laughs> so, um, I think, is there any more burning question that we have not had a chance to cover? Is the application available online now to see what the categories and structure of it looks like? Or are you going with what last year looked like as a starting point? I don't know. I'd be surprised if it's hugely different. Yeah. The advice might be slightly different within the, um, the peer review manual and the guidelines when it gets to that, that stage, but the broad strokes of what we've talked about will certainly be relevant. And I have a question actually to you, Laura. Uh, are we getting any feedback from the research services about our proposals? Because my experience, I personally, the only feedback I got so far was about the project, which we heard wasn't so critical. And I never got really constructive comments from the research services. So I guess there's a two part answer to that. The first is uh, you have to abide by the timeline that they provide you. So if you give them enough time, uh, you will likely receive some feedback. Now, it's true that you're not going to be receiving feedback about the uh, research part, or, or, but you would be likely to receive feedback about um, aspects of the application that they think uh, could don't meet the criteria. If they've noticed something that's not th that uh, sounds like a flag, they would tell you. And it depends a little bit of who is reading. There are there are uh, different. Um, uh, uh, each uh, each of the uh, uh, 
ground reviews in uh, RSR. How many do you guys? We got three. three. Yeah, Tommy. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, first thing, my health care for research services. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's basically just following up on what Ron said. It really depends on the timeline that you're able to give us. In the past, we've had one facilitator reviewing 80 applications, and we give us an internal deadline, but most people submit in the final week before they are due to answer. So at that point, we're doing a very quick review for point of kind of um, any institutional commitments, we'll look at the budget, anything that's like a major red flag that how the university cannot submit this application, which would never happen, that's so rare. But the closer you get to NSERC's timeline, that's kind of what we're left with. The more time that you give us, the more we are able to comment on things like grantsmanship, how well you're speaking to um, the grid that's provided, the three kind of major categories that they're looking at. I don't think there's anyone in our office that's going to speak directly to the science. So that's something that you would always want to look for all of the I would also, I'm going to stand up to emphasize my point. If you are applying this fall, okay, adjust your summer plans to accommodate significant time for writing your proposal, okay? Uh, and when is the right time? You should be starting now, if you haven't started with that today, and aim to have a complete draft of the whole thing by the end of July. And then share it with colleagues to get feedback. If you have an internal review process in your faculty, use it, okay? Because when September comes, you're going to be busy with teaching, with new students, with everything. That's not the time to be putting together your proposal, okay? Uh, that's what I follow myself, and that's what I recommend to everyone. Yeah. All right. Any more last minute question? All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. And I'd like again to thank our panel for their time today.